Everyone's gonna have this song in their head for the rest of the day now. Gonna be trying to sleep tonight. Yeah, exactly. Welcome everybody to From the, backstage uh, at the Folly uh, Studios, Folly this is Geo Party. Um, yesterday, during the uh, event that many of you attended at uh, Skadden, the, um, the event organized by the Chartered Institute and, and NIAC, um, the moderator of the event, uh, Lee uh, Haber-Cook, who's, who's here today, encouraged people to, um, at the end, not make comments, but ask questions Jeopardy style. Uh, we've gone to the next level. Uh, we, we, we've done the whole uh, Jeopardy uh, event. So welcome to Folly Hoak. Um, I will introduce uh, first Rafael Kaminsky, who's joining us from uh, Dubai. Uh, Rafael is a partner of Tenier Pic in Paris. He practices in commercial litigation, international arbitration, and ADR. He serves as a counsel and arbitrator. He's done arbitrations involving defense, uh, telecom, uh, and many other industries. And he also is um, the, the co-chair of Paris Arbitration Week. So he is paying a lot of attention to what we are doing uh, uh, to uh, try to achieve the same thing. So Rafael, um, uh, up to you. Thank, thank you, Daniel. I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. So yeah. I'm actually from backstage at the Folio Act Studios, and this is Geo Party, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> I'd like to present our host, Chris Campbell, who is from South Carolina. He's a college athlete turned lawyer who just finished <laughs> celebrating the special <laughs> month of Squad Over. Chris also manages some of Baker Hughes' most important international commercial arbitrations. Take it away, Chris. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to Arbitral Jeopardy, this very special edition, the game show where answers are given in the form of a question. I'm your host, as Raphael so wonderfully put it, Chris Campbell, and I look forward to sharing this time with all of you today. Good morning. There we go. All right, so let me introduce to you our contestants for today's competition. We have first, all the way from Canada, Alexandra Mitratotis. This Canadian partner at Baskin has expertise in international commercial arbitration and tech. And this is a true fact. Her first time on TV is not, this is not her first time on TV or recording. She actually first appeared on So You Think You Can Dance. And, oh. All right. Yeah. Oh, Next, we've got Miss Catherine Rogers, who is, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have Captain Rogers next. We have Elias Leon, <laughs> sorry about that. There's been some, there's been some personnel changes, so i <laughs> for that. Um, this Venezuelan transplant um, is, a tra is a transplant to the West Village and a former climate change negotiator at COP21. He is also a member of the international litigation and arbitration practice at Foley Blog, who spends his free time taking in Broadway shows and riding horses in Central Park and in the countryside. Let's give it up. <laughs> All right, and finally, last but not least, all the way in my neighbor in Italy from Milan, the founder of Arbitrator Intelligence and an American law professor, Catherine Rogers. Let's give it up. All right, so as a final disclaimer, that our contestants and their answers are for entertainment purposes only and do not necessarily represent their actual views, their knowledge, or the views of their employers. But <laughs> to stay tuned for our panel discussion after the game when contestants will share what they actually uh, think and have to say on this, these topics. Okay, so let's get into the show. As you can see, and for those of you that are not familiar with Jeopardy, the way that this show works is you've got four categories there and you've got point values, dollar totals for each one of those. Those correspond with the difficulty of each question. So one of the contestants will take one of the categories, choose a point value, will call on them. If they get the answer correct, they'll be awarded the points. If not, unfortunately, someone else might have a chance and we'll go from there. Sound good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so let's jump to it. Okay, first, we'll start with you, Elias. Um, I think it's Nagi non signatories for 200. Okay. <laughs> so. 
Sorry. All right. So for two hundred. <laughs> All right. An excited trigger happens right there. All right. <laughs> for two hundred. Okay. Snagging non-signatories. Let's see what the question is. <clears throat> this common law doctrine enables parties to bind non-signatories that have been actively involved in the underlying contract. Um, what is non-signatory glue? Non-signatory glue. Let's see what the survey says. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not non-signatory glue. That, that's, <laughs> that's not a thing. Um, uh, anyone else? <laughs> Catherine? Okay, uh, well, this has got to be... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a last succeed. What is equitable estoppel? Equitable estoppel. Okay, yes. That's the correct answer. So, points for you, Catherine. Hey. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Next question. Okay. Okay. So, Catherine, because you got that right, you get another <laughs> chance to pick the topic. Please uh, make your choice. Okay, I think I'm going to go for dreaded discovery for 200. Okay, dreaded discovery for 200. Let's see the prompt. In this statute, the US Supreme Court interpreted international tribunal as not including either commercial or investment arbitration. Alexandra. <laughs> well, am I able to answer the question? Please. Okay. So, In the form of a question then. Sorry? In the form of a question. Well, everyone knows that uh, that Americans love discovery uh, and the courts give them all sorts of document discovery. They give them all sorts of witness depositions compared to other jurisdictions. So I'm going to guess, uh, what is the Federal Arbitration Act? The Federal Arbitration Act. Ah, okay. The survey did not like that one. Um, so that's not the answer, but let's see. Um, anyone else have a, an answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Evidence. I'm going to go. Okay, but I know that American courts no longer actually allow a lot of discovery because of this interpretation by the Supreme Court. Uh, so the statute that's being asked about, I think, is what is 1782. Uh, 1782. Uh, Sounds like a good year. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, fantastic. Well, no, that's exactly the right answer. And um, Catherine, we're going to stick with you. You're on a roll. Okay. Well, thanks for that. I think I'm going to pick grounding grounds for 400. Grounding grounds for 400. Let's see what the prompt for this one is. Okay, a requirement that must be well-defined, deeply held, and rooted in the most basic notions of morality and justice. Elias. Oh, uh, so sorry about that. Uh, what is being uh, a Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see if that's the right answer. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, and much like the last season of Game of Thrones, big miss. <laughs> um, anyone else want to take a stab at that one? Yes, Catherine. What is public policy? Yes, yes, correct. All right, uh, you know, Catherine, racking up the points. Um, all right, so Catherine, um, with that, with that right answer, um, you get to select the next uh, topic as well. I'm going to take grounding grounds for 800. Grounding grounds for 800. Okay, let's see the prompt. A court recognizes an award under this doctrine to prevent relitigation of a dispute. What is res judicata? No need. <laughs> Res judicata. No need to rehear that one. That's the correct answer. Res judicata. <laughs> All right, and okay, well, look, Catherine, you know the drill by now. Um, next question. Oh, I get to get the next. The is rigged. Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, okay, I'll take uh, arguing about agreements for 200. All right, let's take a look at the prompt. So this one is a true or false question. So 50% chance of getting it right. Um, <laughs> only signatories to an arbitration agreement can enforce that agreement in US courts. Wait. Elias, before you answer that, would you like to hear some uh, thoughts from the audience? Yes, please. Evidently, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you think the answer to this one is true, let's see a show of hands. Show of hands. 
Okay, no one thinks it's true. Okay. <laughs> if you think the answer is false, show of hands. All right, again, 50% chance. Let's see. Uh, so do you want to change your answer? Do you, what do you think about that? What are you going to go with? I go with what the audience is advising me to. So false. Okay, false. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> as you can tell by the... <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is true, and there's no disputing that one. Uh, podcast reference. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so for this one, since uh, we have a little bit of a, an open floor to the, the question, let's go to Alexandra for this next one. All right, I will take grounding grounds for a thousand. Grounding grounds for a thousand. This one is also going to be a poll. Um, so as we'll, we'll take a look at the question, which is, which of the following? is not true, not true, about the doctrine of manifest disregard? Is it A, that it derives from dicta in an overruled Supreme Court case from 1954, another interesting year? B, the restatement provides that manifest disregard is not a ground for challenging international awards. C, no international award has ever been refused enforcement on the ground of manifest disregard. Or D, it allows courts to review arbitral awards of or for errors of fact or law by an arbitral tribunal. So by show of hands, why don't we go in kind to first A, who thinks it's A? No one, okay, fair enough. How about B? Okay, got a vote. And C, okay, a few more, a few more there. And finally D, okay, I did see, okay, a couple of votes there. All right, so um, Alexandra, back to you. What do you think the correct answer would be? Uh, so let's see. Yeah. Which, so we could go to Alexandra, but in fact, uh, why don't we let why don't we let the speakers have a chance to throw in the answer? If you want more help, so well, right, ah, right. So we're going to have an opportunity here. Or we're gonna mix the Jeopardy format with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Where you have a chance to call in for a special guest. And who the special guest could be, I have no idea, I certainly don't. Um, so, Alexander, do you wanna phone in a friend? Yeah, so I'm, I'm debating between B and D. It's really hard, I'm not exactly sure. The restatement had uh, that interpretation cutting off manifest disregard altogether. On the other hand, maybe D is wrong because I didn't think the courts could, in fact, review. Uh, facts and law under manifest disregard. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take my chance to call a friend here. Okay. Okay. All right. So well, I I have no idea who it could be. Uh, dial the phone. Um. <laughs> oh, 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 Hello. Hi, Catherine. This is Alex. <laughs> is the phone call coming? Uh, is it oh, okay. Fair enough. Ah, it's good to hear from you. It's been a while. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm actually calling you because I have an important question I have to ask you. Okay, I'll try my best. <laughs> is it true that the restatement provides that manifest disregard is not a ground for challenging international awards? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question because, uh, as you know, there's some loose language out there in some court cases. Um, but manifest disregard is not in the New York Convention. It's actually also not in the FAA. And after the Hall Street decision, I think there's serious doubt uh, about whether uh, manifest disregard can even be asserted as a ground. Uh, now, again, there's some loose language, including in a Supreme Court case, unfortunately, Stolt Nielsen and a few other cases. But uh, to the best of our research, although we've seen some courts, even in international cases, reference the doctrine, we've actually never seen a case where it was relied on either to set aside an award that was seated in the United States or to refuse recognition and enforcement of the award. So by those terms, you know, I think the, uh, what we decided to do with the restatement is to treat this zombie doctrine uh, like it was really dead. And how do you kill a zombie, you cut off its head. So if you look in the restatement, the black letter says uh, that in fact, uh, you cannot invoke it, period. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks, Catherine. My pleasure. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. <laughs> All right, I am confident. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's see what the... Yeah? Okay. No? Sorry. Yeah? Wait. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is D. It is D. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Right. There we go. Okay. Very well. Very well. Well, look. Um, that is all the time we have for this episode. Um, especially there's no need to determine who has more points or anything like that. Uh, everybody is going to hear Harvard's Jeopardy. We thank you to the audience for coming. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, so with that, we're transitioning now to something a little bit more serious. Uh, we're going to invite Daniel to come back up. While Daniel's coming up, I'm going to go ahead and say that this was a really fun thing to put together, which could not have been done without Alias's amazing uh, organization. This is really fun. Uh, unrivaled, I think. Uh, and I also wanted to thank Daniel for inviting me to participate in Fully Hope for hosting this, um, which is quite an incredible event that they put together. Uh, with that, we're going to transition to a panel discussion. Um, and we each picked topics that we think are interesting and unique to US law uh, that people may or may not be familiar with that either invoke a myth, a common myth outside the United States. You saw some of these foreshadowed in the questions like document production, you know, the, the view from outside, especially before the recent Supreme Court case. Uh, and we're going to take these topics in turn uh, with a little bit more serious discussion, but also interactive on the panel. And then we are also gonna invite the audience. Uh, we were gonna hold those questions until the end for the audience, but I'm gonna go ahead and invite you, if you do have a question, to just raise your hand. Um, which, uh, or, or jump in because we, we want to have this be as interactive as possible. Okay, so with that, uh, first up, I'm going to ask, invite Alex to. So thanks, Catherine. Um, my topic is, uh, oh, actually, there we go. Um, I'm actually doing dreaded discovery as the topic. So a little bit of preview from the game show, like Catherine said, and I'm going to speak about uh, the recent updates that we've heard from the, the U.S. Supreme Court on 1782s. But just to, to get a sense of the audience, how many people here practice in New York uh, or in the US, in fact? And how many people are practicing from outside of the US? Okay, so about 50-50. Um, and, and how many people then have utilized uh, Section 1782 procedure in an international arbitration? So not many, which is which was actually what I would expect. So the, the general approach uh, in international arbitration is, of course, that discovery should be limited. Um, and foreign parties, and I can say this being from Canada, hence my Canadian flags, um, I often have clients that are concerned about having arbitration seated in the U.S. because there is more um, breadth of discovery, typically, especially on the litigation side, that uh, that people fear then in an arbitration when they have an arbitration seated in New York. And I think, you know, um, the U.S. falls on the extreme spectrum of having depositions and documents, whereas civil law jurisdictions, and I believe the U.K. are more on the other side. Canada, we fall somewhere um, in the middle of that. But the good news is this, the U.S. Supreme Court has very recently placed limits on discovery rights and has closed the door on Section 1782 discovery in aid of foreign international arbitrations. So for those who aren't as familiar with it, what is a seven, Section 1782? So it provides that a district court of the district in which a person resides or is found um, may order them to give either a testimony or a statement or to produce a document or other thing for use in a foreign proceeding or international tribunal. And the order may be made pursuant to a letter rogatory um, or a request made by a foreign or international tribunal um, or upon application of any interested person. So that's, that's the section that we're dealing with that the Supreme Court uh, recently addressed. And they had previously ruled in 2004 that the Commission of the European Communities which is a quasi-judicial arm of the European Union, was a foreign or international tribunal under this section. So that was the previous ruling that we had in 2004 from the Supreme Court. Then in 2021, um, they're faced with the question uh, in Serpatonics versus Rolls-Royce of whether a district court can compel discovery proceedings in private foreign arbitrations. Um, however, they didn't actually come to answering that question because Servotonics <laughs> withdrew its petition prior to the hearing because most of the arbitration hearing had concluded at that point. So we then get to June 2022. 
And now the Supreme Court is faced with the same question again of whether Section 1782 applies to foreign private international arbitration proceedings that do not involve a governmental or quasi-governmental body. And this question um, has been a subject of circuit split um, with intermediate appellate courts coming to different conclusions in the U.S. So my understanding is the second, the fifth, and the seventh circuits had held that 1782 does not extend to international arbitration, but, um, but that in 2019 and 2020, the fourth and sixth circuits <coughs> held that it did. So we have the appellate court split on this issue. So right for the, the Supreme Court to determine uh, what they want to do about it. So two cases actually go before the Supreme Court uh, at the same time. The first one is ZF Automotive versus Luxshare. And in this case, we have a U.S. company and a Hong Kong company that had agreed to resolve their, arbit their case through arbitration in Germany. And before initiating the arbitration, Luxshare sought a 1782 discovery from ZF. Uh, so a Michigan court, a district court, granted the discovery, and then the Sixth Circuit denied the stay. Then the other case we have that goes up at the same time is Alex Partners versus the Fund for Protection of Investors' Rights in Foreign States. And here we have a Russian corporation that had commenced an arbitration against the government of Lithuania under a bit. Um, between Russia and Lithuania. So we're in the investor state side, whereas the other one's commercial. And the bit here authorized an investor to initiate ad hoc arbitration uh, under the UNCTRAL rules. And then the fund, so one of the parties, uh, filed for a 1782 application um, in the Southern District of New York, seeking discovery from Alex Partners and an individual as well. And the district court granted the request and the second circuit affirmed it. So the result, what do we get from these two decisions? So the Supreme Court unanimously held that 1782 requires a foreign or international tribunal to be a governmental or intergovernmental um, branch or agency and ne neither adjudicative body qualified as that in these two cases. So the court looked at the language in 1782 and they looked at the modifiers foreign and international and tribunal. And so those modifiers beside tribunal and they said it's best understood as an adjudicative body that exercises governmental authority. And that's what triggers 1782. So specifically, they found that a foreign tribunal is a tribunal imbued with governmental authority by a nation, while an international tribunal is a tribunal imbued with a governmental authority by multiple nations. And they said the purpose behind 1782 is comedy. It's respect for foreign nations and the government, uh, governmental and intergovernmental bodies in those cases that they create. So the court held that expanding 1782 to include private bodies would be a significant tension with the Federal Arbitration Act because 1782 permits much broader discovery than the FAA permits. So the court noted, though, that we had two different cases in front of them. They had a commercial arbitration case and then they had an investor state case. And they said the Zenith automotive case was more straightforward because it was two private parties um, that were in a commercial arbitration context. Uh, and so it was clear that 1782 did not apply there. However, in the Alex Partners case, because it was an investor state case, it wasn't as straightforward because one of the parties is a sovereign. Uh, and so here in this specific case, they said the bit gave the investors the option to resolve the dispute before a governmental body, but they instead chose to do an ad hoc arbitration before a panel where they picked their own arbitrators. So in this case, the treaty itself did not create the panel and the panel functioned independently. Um, and it, there was no governmental tribunal in that sense. So I think what that means is they haven't foreclosed the possibility that foreigns might, uh, that sorry, that sovereigns might imbue an ad hoc arbitration panel with governmental authority. So I think 
we have perhaps more to see to come on the investor state world and how they how 1782 will be interpreted in that context. Um, and, the, and the question is unanswered, I think, as to whether a tribunal constituted under ICSID could potentially qualify as a foreign or international tribunal in the way the courts interpreted the language there. Um, I also think some other practical considerations that arise out of this uh, is what happens to people who obtained discovery in an arbitration before this decision, which was only in June, are they able to use that discovery? Um, and so what else is available now to parties? Well, there's section seven of the Federal Arbitration Act still, that's available to parties in arbitration seated in the US. Uh, and what that provides is arbitrators can summon any person to attend before them as a witness and to bring any documents with them or records that could be deemed uh, as material evidence in the case. You also have in New York section uh, 33102 uh, from the New York Civil Practice uh, Law and Rules. So that's another tool where witnesses that are located in New York, uh, you can seek discovery in aid of an arbitration. So that may be a replacement for 1782. And then lastly, you of course have your contract. So especially in the commercial context, you can put directly in your arbitration clause what kind of discovery you wanna have and whether you're gonna have um, you know, free hearing witness examinations and what you're gonna do with documents. So it might be that we see more of that going directly into the contract moving forward. I'm going to go ahead and, and make a few comments in addition to that, because even if it wasn't in my introduction, uh, I am one of the four reporters on the restatement, along with George Berman, who, of course, you all know, uh, Jack Coe, uh, who's in Pepperdine, California, and Chris Drahosel, who's in Kansas. Um, and it actually I have warm feelings every time I return to New York because so much of our drafting was done in conference rooms physically here in New York. Um, and I wanna take a poll because we had a lot of drafts of the restatement before it's finally now with the publisher. How, would you, how many think that we did not have to change the restatement when the decision arrived in June? How many thought, so we had the whole section drafted about whether document production was available under 1782 or not. And then we get this decision in June. <coughs> Did we have to go rewrite the section or were we good? Did we anticipate what the Supreme Court was gonna say? Okay, we'll start with the positive. We anticipated. You guys have no confidence in the report. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell George on you, actually. We had, to, it's kind of easy because once you've written the whole thing, you just have to flip the, the you add a knot in there. Um, actually, that's not the time. <laughs> a little error with a knot. And we actually did have to change the, the section itself quite a bit, but we had engaged in extensive analysis of the history and details, including many of the ones that Alex brought up. Um, but that was a really interesting thing because we had a couple of Supreme Court decisions that have come out recently and that changed or altered our, our reasoning on the restatement, um, which again, this is a paid commercial, is coming out soon. It's at a publisher <laughs> near you. Okay. Uh, with that, I actually now want to invite Rafael Kaminsky to give, he's from Dubai, but he's been patiently waiting, and he is going to weigh in now on a chosen topic. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I wanted to jump in on, on the question of the non-signatory. Um, as you know, this is a subject on which we are very familiar in France as uh, the group of company doctrine in the Dow chemical case uh, was bursted around the 1990s. And to be honest, I thought that we were quite unique in France with this doctrine and the fact that we could uh, have any party directly involved in the performance of an agreement uh, being, uh, being able to enforce the, the arbitration agreement, even though there are not signatories. So I was very uh, happy uh, and surprised to discover that uh, under the uh, uh, equitable estoppel doctrine, um, uh, so long as a party had been actively involved in the in the underlying contract, it could also uh, be considered as a party to the arbitration agreement. And I just wanted to to discuss briefly about the the latest case from the Supreme Court, uh, which dates back already to June first, twenty twenty, in the GE Energy Power Conversion France SAS versus Otokumpu Stainless USA LC. 
in which, uh, even though it doesn't touch upon every area of what we're going to talk now, uh, the Supreme Court held that nothing in the New York Convention prevented uh, the, a, a court from raising the equitable estoppel doctrine. As uh, at, before this ruling, there was a split again in the circuits, and I believe, again, it was between the first, second, and fourth circuits, so including New York, uh, that considered that Chapter 2 of the Federal Arbitration Act could apply, uh, uh, we could apply the equitable estoppel doctrine to uh, the, the cases referred to under Chapter 2, while the Ninth and Eleventh Circuit thought that uh, it was only possible in cases of arbitration under Chapter 1, but not under Chapter 2, considering that the New York Convention required a signed arbitration agreement. Uh, so this uh, Supreme Court ruling was extremely interesting in that it made a, a very precise analysis of the, the text of the New York Convention, and the conclusion was clearly that there was nothing in the New York Convention preventing from having a non-signatory uh, seeing an arbitration agreement enforced uh, against him. Uh, however, there is one remaining issue uh, which is to be uh, uh, treated by the 11th Circuit in this particular case, which is to know what is the applicable law to this question. Under which law should we determine whether the equitable estoppel doctrine or any other doctrine should be applied in this case? And this creates a lot of questions because we could consider that it would be the federal law or the state law or any foreign law. And we currently have no very precise answer apart from another ruling from the Ninth Circuit in a case, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation, of Balkrishna Seti against uh, Shrivnas uh, Sungandalaya LLP, uh, in which the Ninth, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit held that this question should be governed by the federal law. Uh, however, there was a dissenting opinion from Judge Bea who thought that it should be state law that should govern this issue. Uh, and this is, again, something that remains open, as in the, the GE case from the Supreme Court, the case was remanded to the 11th Circuit. But as far as I know, uh, there has not been any ruling yet on this case. And there is, even if there was a ruling, there is a risk here that we end up again with a split circuit on this, whether we should apply federal law, state law, or possibly any foreign law. And I just I would just like to mention very briefly that uh, uh, as a, as an opening the the discussion on this that the French position in that respect is quite interesting because it considers that any decision should not be taken taken into a consideration conflict of laws or any applicable law not the law of the contract nor any other law but that we should apply a substantive rule method uh, leading to a validity principle of the arbitration agreement. So basically, under French law, the only question that arises is whether or not the party has been actively involved and has directly been involved in the performance of the contract. And so long as this is the case, no matter what is the law applicable to the contract or any rule that would re result from any conflict of law rules, then we can extend or we can apply the arbitration agreement to the non-signatory. So that was what I wanted to, to touch base upon tonight with you very quickly. Yeah, and I guess I would throw in there too, um, especially coming from a corporate or a business perspective, multinationals that are doing business across borders, often in the United States, often in contexts where you not necessarily have the entity that may be the part subject to an action has been a signatory. It's that last point that I think Raphael was uh, driving at that really sort of we've seen um, be interesting in some of our cases, but I've also just seen in my practice, it's that how active has the party that you're trying to join to the arbitration been in the dispute? How, is it actually an alter ego that is, you know, one party has been used to sign the agreement because that's their local partner. And then in fact, another uh, entity is actually controlling and executing the contract, or is there a legitimate argument as to legal personhood and separability in that context? I think those are questions that you're going to continue to have, notwithstanding um, the, the Supremes over at SCOTUS and what they made that made in their decision. But um, I mean, the reality too, is uh, as you pointed out, 11th Circuit still has uh, the, the decision, so we have to see what happens there. And ultimately, what they decide, there will have large ramifications as to whether or not non-signatories can join. And that's something that if you are litigating or have any part of your dispute that touches in the United States, that's certainly something we're going to advise your clients on to be careful of and thoughtful of. And frankly, as a, the final point I would make there, to proactively tell your in-house clients about, too, to say, you could have the ability, you know, be careful about how you're executing this contract, because you could, in fact, find yourself dragged into an arbitration. So things to be thoughtful of. I'm going to add a little bit to that because, uh, again, drawing from a, the restatement, it's sort of irresistible for me. So one of the answers you saw also was res judicata. 
I think issues of uh, non-signatories <coughs> came up when we were actually discussing res judicata and collateral estoppel. So little uh, aside, if you don't know these doctrines because they are very much common law doctrines, uh, is res judicata precludes any case that attempts to relitigate a case that was already um, litigated. This we say in the restatement and, and is uh, under US case law also applies to an arbitral award. So if anyone sought to start a new case, uh, a new case in a, in a litigation, the most classic application is the person who has the award would come in and say, you can't relitigate this because I have an award. One interesting little wrinkle we had there was, well, wait a minute, if one party is seeking to enforce the arbitration agreement and one party is seeking to enforce the award, uh, you could actually have a tension, right? And because the party with the award might say, send this question of res judicata to the arbitrators. Court, don't look at it. Uh, and so the restatement deals, deals with that. The reason why I think res judicata is relevant with non-signatories is when we were drafting that section, one of the issues that came up constantly is how much, how much more frequently parties are in court, um, both at the beginning and the end of arbitrations. Um, trying to resist or whatnot. And the idea, and one of the grounds that's often invoked is trying to get a non-signatory involved. And sometimes that can be an extensive and protracted litigation because it can be very fact intensive. And if you've spent you know, six months a year trying to get one of the non-signatories to be a party, and then if you have to go re-litigate that uh, at the end, or you have to present it to the tribunal, which actually does make a separate decision, but what is the res judicata effect of the first court's decision or a foreign court's decision, finding that the non-signatory is bound during award enforcement? Okay, do you have to at the award enforcement stage relitigate for another two years whether the non-signatory is bound? Um, so res judicata can do a lot of work with non-signatories and the need to relitigate that question. I'll tell you one little tidbit since we have a little extra time. Uh, so. Full confession, I did the drafting on the res judicata collateral estoppel sections of the restatement in case you couldn't already tell. Uh, <laughs> but um, I thought they just, they ended up being really fascinating. And I'll tell you um, a, a little tidbit about, we had a, a German civil procedure professor and an Italian actually from Milan uh, professor in the room at the time when we were drafting. You, we draft and then we present to a room of advisors and they critique literally line by line where the comma should be. Oftentimes <laughs> it's stressful, but uh, interesting. So collateral estoppel, for those of you who don't know, is based on res judicata, okay? But instead of saying that the entire case is blocked, it's oftentimes referred to as issue preclusion. And the idea is you can't relay to get an issue, okay? So with non-signatories, it's actually not the underlying case that you're trying to block. It's actually the question of the non-signatory. Is this non-signatory bound? Okay, and so if you don't have issue estoppel, you can just take out the issue and essentially prevent it from being relitigated. It, it can be a, a problem and, and it happens in other contexts as well. When we were drafting the restatement, uh, we had uh, the German civil procedure professor stand up and I, no joke, kind of pound his fist and say, there, you know, you can't do this to foreign parties because collateral estoppel doesn't exist outside of uh, the United States and it's and you know even non parties to the original arbitration can invoke collateral estoppel in some aggressive versions. So in the restatement we actually had to find a balance so that foreign parties wouldn't be unfairly surprised. And that's actually part of the standard we built in by uh, these kind of doctrines being invoked here, uh, but they mainly apply, for example, if a US court. In fact, the restatement only speaks to US courts, um, but you should know that US courts have a sort of very powerful set of tools. Uh, in collateral estoppel and res judicata to prevent relitigation of both issues uh, and the case. Um, and for more on that, read the restatement. Uh, <laughs> okay, it, actually, I'm gonna just jump open and say, cause we've got this really attentive audience. Any questions so far? I welcome them on res judicata and collateral estoppel. No? Uh, any thoughts so far? Have, you, have any of you been li recently litigating non-signatory issues? No one wants to raise their hand. Probably got called. She's a professor. She will call uh -huh. on me. Okay. All right. With that, let's move on uh, to me. Uh, sorry. I guess I'm kind of a little hog here of all no. the attention. Sorry. You also were like that in the trivia game. You won every question. I know. <laughs> I, uh, oh, wait. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
community paper called Catherine. Maybe you could just clarify for the audience. So under the US law, when you assess rest of the card defects, uh, uh, do you apply the triple identity test? Uh, uh, identity of the parties is one of them or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way res judicata is kind of framed in the United States is, is we it's not strictly the same, uh, the exact case, right? It has to be the same parties, but same parties can extend to, uh, you know, a, a part like a sub, you know, a, an entity that's related. So it's an, an entity that has the same interest. And that's much broader than most civil law systems. And it has to be the same issue. But for example, if the first case was based on fraud, and the second one is based on breach of contract, we treat it as the same issue if there is, and this is the language of US courts, a common nucleus of operative facts. So very common law like, we look at the facts of the case and we say, we don't care what allegations come out of this, it's the same case if it's based on the same essentially events. In the restatement, we actually added another requirement um, to say that it also has to be consistent with the party's agreement. So the parties could actually uh, exclude it and uh, their reasonable expectations. If it would somehow disrupt that, uh, at least there's an argument for not applying uh, under the, but it was, we really worked hard on those sections uh, because there was such chaotic mess in the case law. And it's one of the times where the restatement really did, you know, had to try and do what it was, what it was supposed to. Um, but thanks for the res judicata question. I never get those. Yes? Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is identity of relief a relevant consideration by any chance? Um, I think it certainly the parties would consider it relevant, but for example, if you first brought a contract claim and you got relief and the same facts, you realize later you could have gotten punitive damages by are, are alleging that it's a fraud, you, that's precluded. So the damages are precluded and the measure of damage is not something that's considered as, as risk. Otherwise you could always, right, find some new damages and, and work around it. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I <laughs> okay, so one other topic. Let me actually also say, I'm not a, a microphone hog. We actually, uh, I can't explain the reasons because they're quite personal, but Miriam al she was actually supposed to be at this podium uh, and uh, as the contestant, I was supposed to be in the background with you, um, but she had uh, I, an incident, she was victim of an incident this morning that I wouldn't be surprised if it made the front page of the news this afternoon. Um, and she had a truly urgent situation that she uh, had to attend. She was heroic in still trying to get here, uh, truly heroic. But we finally said, you know, you have to deal with safety issues first. So that's why she couldn't be here. She was supposed to be the kind of winner of the, you know, getting all the questions. <laughs> and she was also supposed to address the next topic. So uh, I'm going to start it off, but I'd, I'll invite you to, to share your thoughts. Um, so she was going to address what we might call professionalism issues and i'm going to start it and then hand it over to daniel um i'm going to address focus on arbitrator immunity um so if you're not from the us you might not be familiar with this uh, again it's a topic in the restatement um and it was i'll give you a little bit of the behind the scenes in the in the restatement as well because it was um so if you don't already know the united states is one of the only jurisdictions in the world I, th I say one of because maybe there's another one out there. I've never heard of another one out there. We couldn't find another one. So I think it's probably more right to say it's the only jurisdiction in the world that has something called absolute immunity. Qualified immunity is probably what you're more familiar with. Qualified immunity is if you act reckless as an arbitrator or in bad faith, I think is the standard in English law, okay? You can be subject to a civil lawsuit. And I think there's some idea that that might be a reasonable thing. We, we want immunity because we don't want arbitrators, suing arbitrators to be sort of a, a roundabout way of appealing a decision you don't like. But at the same time, we all know arbitrators sometimes misbehave and the parties may have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars just into the pockets of the arbitrators, notwithstanding the other damages when they have to relitigate the case. So it seems reasonable if the arbitrator was reckless uh, in their behavior, that maybe there is a window there for qualified, that qualified immunity would allow a suit. What absolute immunity means is if we had an arbitrator on video with clear sound, accepting a bribe from one of the parties and agreeing to rule in their favor, you could get the award set aside or refused recognition and enforcement. You might be able to start criminal proceedings but you could not sue that arbitrator in civil court to, to, for any sort of recovery. 
Okay. Uh, and that's what absolute means. Absolute means absolute. Uh, and in fact, there was an al credible allegation, I believe, of an arbitrator who did accept a bribe and it was kicked out on absolute immunity. When we were drafting the restatement, we saw a couple of cracks what we thought were cracks in the absolutism. Um, and we also thought maybe this is a time when the US should come, you know, should be open to aligning itself more with the rest of the world. We looked at some cases uh, out of Texas and the Midwest that said, well, if an arbitrator doesn't render a decision, that's different than, than committing malpractice in the case. Uh, and, and, and so we should treat that differently. Uh, and they, they allowed suit for non-rendering of a decision. And then there were some other cases domestic where it was the institution that really uh, engaged in what was, I think, clearly biased, uh, inappropriate behavior against consumers. And the court in that place you know, opened up the door a little bit, you know, probably should have said, no, nope, absolute, but, but they opened it. Um, the, uh, we proposed a draft very early and our, let's just say we got annihilated by our, our advisors. They're like, you can't do this. And one of the reasons why, that they cited, and I think this is relevant to the dispelling myths issue, uh, is that uh, in the United States, we're known for being litigation happy. So that once you create the possibility that there can be a suit against the arbitrator, uh, you're gonna start having just lots of suits that you can't dismiss early. Uh, and that would be a huge problem uh, for arbitrators, for parties who wanna litigate, if, who wanna seat their arbitration in the United States. So it did remain in the restatement, uh, notwithstanding some efforts in the early stages, uh, absolute. And that is consistent with the vast majority of case law in the United States. Uh, but there is, I would say, another slight exception. Uh, so the absolute immunity only extends to activities that the arbitrator um, engages in in her capacity as an arbitrator. So if it's outside the scope of her work as an arbitrator, immunity doesn't apply. So when I taught this, I used to have to give this example in class that if when they were leaving the hearing, they got into a car accident with the arbitrator, they couldn't say, the arbitrator couldn't say, hey, I have absolute immunity, you can't sue me. But there's a much better example now, uh, which I think uh, is uh, also quite tragic for our profession. Um, and it involves the NRA, the National Rifle Association. They had a case, uh, in, they had a judge from the south side of Chicago um, who sat for 30 years, also in criminal cases there, uh, who was their sole arbitrator. And one of the associates got this very strange email from him that had uh, unbelievably racist, I mean, you know, no ambiguity, heinous attachments uh, on, on just racist uh, garbage, let's say. And she's like, why am I receiving this? Uh, and it turns out he was sharing it with all his golf buddies. And he accidentally, that's an outlook, uh, beware of outlook autofill, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, accidentally sent it to, to counsel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, uh, and there now immediately uh, the, the arbitrator uh, got removed, um, but they had lost a lot of time and money and, and effort um, and they were interested in suing this. And to me, that was a classic example of an arbitrator in ex parte communication, something that has nothing to do with the arbitration as outside the scope. Um, they also, it was interesting, um, wanted to sue, and I think did sue, uh, the institution, which was JAMS. Uh, it was a little tricky for JAMS, I think, because, uh, first of all, they have to verify the factual accuracy. They can't just take him off the roster the same day. Um, they probably have some obligations to kind of investigate and whatnot, but they took him down pretty quickly, um, and he's not there. But it was a, it was a really a disturbing example of a, of a sole arbitrator, um, even though race wasn't an issue in that case. Um, it was, it was an interesting case. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop on arbitrator immunity, unless there are any questions, comments. Have any of you ever tried to sue an arbitrator? So with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel for some comments on counsel and, and civility. So a couple of, couple of words on the um, disqualification of counsel. The, the question is, um, you're sitting as an arbitrator. One of the parties asks you to disqualify uh, opposing counsel because, for instance, of a conflict of interest, right? And who has the authority to decide this, right? You, you know the theme of New York Arbitration Week uh, this year is, you know, who's in charge? So if you have that question, who gets to decide the question of uh, disqualification of counsel? It, it really does not come up very often, 
right? Uh, lawyers are aggressive, but they rarely uh, seek to disqualify the other side. It happened to me once um, as, as arbitrator. Um, one of the parties uh, argued that the uh, lawyer for the other side had a conflict of interest and should be removed, um, but didn't really say who should decide that question. And so I asked who should decide that question. Um, and there was never a clear answer that the arbitrator from that party and, and the case, um, uh, the challenge then was, was waived. Um, so once the arbitration was over, I, I looked at it a little bit and, and there is a trend, there is an evolution um, in the US historically um, you have an old uh, decision of the state court uh, appellate division in the first department called uh, Bitterman, um, where the, the, there's just one paragraph in that decision and it says, uh, disqualification of counsel involves issues of public policy. So it's for the, it's, it's, the court should decide. Um, there are a number of decisions after that and the restatement which is way more nuanced on the ability of uh, an arbitrator actually uh, find that counsel should be disqualified because of a conflict of interest. So that there, there are principal issues that come up. There's a jurisdiction question that comes up because the lawyer didn't sign the arbitration clause, right? Um, there's an arbitrability question that comes up because, uh, you know, it, some disciplinary bodies may have exclusive uh, jurisdiction to decide questions of uh, disqualification of counsel. But you have a number of decisions in the US, in Delaware, in New Jersey, in uh, New York, now that say in the first instance, the arbitrators can um, uh, decide the question of disqualification of counsel. We, the court at the end may review um, uh, the whole process, but in the first instance, the arbitrators who are more familiar with the case and in control of the case can uh, decide the question. So uh, it may come up in, in, in a future case. So Alex Raphael, sorry, Alex Raphael, do you, have you ever uh, dealt with this issue and what would happen in France or Canada? Alex Raphael, you wanna go first? I, I have to say, I've never, I've never encountered um, this issue in, Canada. And I, I don't know the answer to who would think that it's their, their job to deal with it. I, I, I believe in France, it would be for the bar to handle this. It would be considered as an ethical question that would be handled by the, by the head of the bar uh, of, of, of the local. Well, if, it's, if it was a, a French council or a Parisian council, it would be the, the head of the Paris bar, probably. Sorry, go ahead. But, but, uh, what, what if it's not a French What if, what if, um, a lawyer admitted in New York came uh, to argue a case in Paris in an international arbitration, and that lawyer is not admitted to the Paris bar. So who gets to decide? Uh, that that's a very, very tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, cle clearly not the, the head of the Paris bar for sure, uh, and and it would probably I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened actually in an interesting arbitration, and and one was uh, recently challenged in Texas on the ground that uh, there was a conflict of interest between counsel and, and one of the parties. And the ground was, was public policy. It was like, look, if you let this arbitration go forward and opposing counsel knows confidential information, that's just unfair. Uh, and you know, it, so much so um, that either Article 5.1b, I couldn't present my case, didn't have an opportunity, or uh, Article 5.2b, a violation of public policy. That case, the court, didn't weigh in on the issue of whether this was enough to overturn and to refuse recognition and enforcement to an award because the party had, had really waived the issue. But it has come up and the real challenge is when you have a foreign, the arbitration seated in a place and you have foreign counsel who aren't licensed there. Did you have an example for us? Well, not an example, I, I would, the question was the mechanics. Does it, oh, oh wait, I'll wait for this. If, if this comes up early, it usually comes up early in the arbitration and then let's say the arbitrators make a decision one way or the other, I'm gonna sidestep the jurisdiction issue for a second. Well, mechanically, does the next step, does the next step go to court as opposed to allowing the arbitration to go forward? And because that's what you're talking about. If, if there's a mistake, the prejudice is being built during the course of uh, you know, that, that arbitration. Yeah. 
I mean, the answer is actually it's it's a terrible mess because, uh, and there was an there is an attorney uh, who's who's also worked on this case on the IBA guidelines for party representatives, and he likes to tell this story. He he gave what would be considered a very typical American cross examination of an Italian executive who was profoundly offended by the experience and and truly believed it was. Uh, as most of the rest of the world, uh, that this was barbaric, unprofessional behavior by the American attorney, so much so that he really did want to explore, it wasn't disqualification, but it was sanctions or something. And this was an, attor an American attorney practicing in London. Uh, there was, I think the case was uh, seated in Switzerland, a ward enforced in Italy. And he basically went to the New York bar, the London bar, where he was, uh, his law firm was, to the Swiss bar and to the Italian bar. Uh, none of them accepted uh, the, the challenge. Um, but it, it, it's an example of if you have, there are some bars where it's mandatory, they only have that exception. Also in Germany, it would never go to a court. So the idea that maybe an arbitrator steps into the shoes of, of what the judge would do um, doesn't make sense in some jurisdictions. Um, it's a little bit of a free-for-all right now. Um, the IBA guidelines on party representation uh, attempted to massage that, but it can only go so far because uh, you know it's subject always to mandatory law. Yeah. So I immediately think about due process when, when or fairness, procedural fairness, let's call it when it comes to this. Um, and I wonder what, what you think of this, because a party can also immediately argue that, you know, if I can't have the counsel that I chose to represent me in this case, then I can't present my case. Um, I think, I can't remember the name, but I think there is a case that uh, took place in England or England and Wales. And so what happened there, I think, was halfway through the proceedings, so everything was, was fine in the beginning, halfway through the proceedings, I think one of the party representatives was changed in order to intentionally create a conflict uh, with a tribunal member, I believe, and so they were part of the same chambers, and so that, that whole discussion started there. But I think, it, it, I mean, in those circumstances, that sort of maneuver was, was so intentional and so strategically uh, surgical to that point that, that in that situation that clearly stands out. Um, but in, in most others, I wonder if, if parties won't immediately raise that, that, that argument with the, with the tribunal and then with courts. Yeah, so the case you're referring to, I think, is probably Hep versus Slovenia. Uh, it was an investment case, and the tribunal, it was um, Jan Post. So the, it, they, they actually created a conflict with this late appearing barrister, the president of the tribunal, uh, who could not continue to serve if the conflict was there. He would have to step down. <laughs> Um, and they wrote an opinion saying they had the power to disqualify counsel. Um, they refer to the ICSID rules, which have some provisions that are unique. Also kind of the, the heft of, a, of an investment tribunal, I think played a part there. Uh, and the fact that it was the president of, of the tribunal as well. And in that instance, bringing in counsel misconduct, actually, uh, there was also some, some kind of petty bickering. Uh, the, when they heard of the new um, our attorney uh, barrister coming in, they actually, the other side requested some more information. When did he come on, whatnot? And they refused to even tell and took the position, we get our attorney of choice. Your choice is always subject to some limitation. Um, another fun one involving Canada, the Pope Talbot case. Do you know that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. I thought we were so, okay, got it. All right. Uh, so the, the, the one last thing I'll say is this is also coming up now with experts switching sides. Um, and their tribunals have a different power because they can just exclude the evidence. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to our host again, Daniel. So um, just by a few words by way of conclusion. Um, th there's, I mean, sometimes um, in-house lawyers, general counsel outside of the U.S. are concerned about choosing New York um, as a seat of arbitration because they feel that it's going to, the arbitration is going to take a long time. Um, it's going to cost a lot of money. There will be a lot of discovery. So what Alex um, described earlier um, is that it, you know, courts in the U.S. will not grant now discovery in aid of a commercial arbitration seat at abroad. Um, Alex mentioned also um, the Federal Arbitration Act, which is um, an act that Section 7 governs um, 
arbitration seated in the US and the ability to go to court to get uh, discovery from a third party um, in connection with an arbitration that has a, a US seat. And um, it used to be the case that arbitrators would sign very easily subpoenas saying to a third parties, provide documents, um, uh, appear before me. Th there's a, a, a relatively recent decision uh, that was issued last year in, in February um, by Judge Rakoff in the Southern District of New York, which is in a sense um, a game changer in that respect because it makes it more difficult to get um, discovery from uh, third parties. What, what the case was about, it involved an arbitration seated in New York and a third party that was on the West Coast. And um, what Judge Rakoff ruled uh, construing the, the federal rules of civil procedure and the Federal Arbitration Act is that the, the arbitrator cannot just sign a subpoena directing a, a witness on the West Coast to appear by Zoom for a, a deposition. That the arbitrator actually has to think about, um, do I really need this information from the third party? And if the answer is yes, the arbitrator needs to be prepared to actually travel to the West Coast where the witness is to hear the witness. And that imposes, creates a, an immediate limit because uh, arbitrators and, and a number of them here uh, have started to think about the issue and being more careful about issuing subpoenas because you want them to be enforceable um, about, do I really need to hear from this person who's far away? Because if I do, I need to actually travel. So what, what, what you see is that the courts generally here are helpful and, and supportive of arbitration. Um, and it's particularly visible in the context of discovery where there are limits that have been, uh, that have been imposed. Um, you know, in-house lawyers outside of the US also think, you know, if I come to New York, if I come to the US, uh, I'm going to face uh, uh, practitioners and arbitrators who are a little bit um, uh, self-centered uh, or insular in the way they're thinking. And um, I think it, it, it's no longer true of the international arbitration community of today. I mean, Catherine asked before how many people here um, are, are practicing in New York. And you see that many, many of you practice in New York and are from uh, other jurisdictions, right? I mean, you look at the two co-chairs of New York Arbitration Week uh, this year, Natalie comes from Jamaica, I come from France, and uh, like many of our colleagues uh, in the community, we, we come from a different jurisdiction. We practice here, um, we serve as arbitrators and counsel all over the world, uh, we engage with our colleagues uh, uh, outside of the US. And, and our colleagues who are actually from uh, New York originally also engage with the arbitration community uh, abroad. So it's, you know, this fear or concern um, that arbitrators and practitioners in New York will be insular is less, um, uh, I think, founded than um, than before. So with that, I would like to thank uh, a number of people for organizing this uh, e event. I, I would like to thank all the Foley HOAG technical team because they <laughs> transformed this conference room into a studio. Uh, uh, it looks you know, as good as the NBC studios. Across the studio. uh, it, it looks much better than the Fox studios uh, two blocks uh, south. Um, I, I would like to thank Elias Leon, who's uh, not only a great lawyer, but also incredibly creative, resourceful, and tech savvy. I would like to thank Raphael, uh, Alex, uh, Miriam, uh, uh, our panelists uh, who were supported from day one um, and agreed to participate and be uh, players in the game show and then provide uh, remarks. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris, who's an amazing uh, master, <laughs> phenomenal. Um, uh, because this is the first time that a game show is done at New York Arbitration Week. I think it's, I think it's the first time a game show is done as a, a, an arbitration event in 
uh, New York, it was incredibly creative and refreshing, and it took an enormous amount of time to put together. So uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to say again, we really regret that Miriam couldn't be here and, and we're all hoping that everything works out for her. So have a great time in the New York publication. Thank you. Thank you.